Mr. Nilua Basu is a Singapore-based economist who is currently an adjunct professor at Essex Asia Pacific Business School. It's a Singapore campus of the one of the prestigious French Grand Ecoles. He was previously Chief Economist for Southeast Asia and India at Credit Suisse First Boston, Chief Asia Economist at Dia Securities, and Director of the Asia Services Water and Econometrics. After schooling from St. Paul's Darjeeling, Mr. Basu obtained a BA Honours in Economics from St. Stephen's College, dual Master's degrees in Public Administration and International Relations from University of Pennsylvania, and pursued PhD studies in Development Economics and International Political Economy from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Kunal Sarkar, a, ve a very qualified cardiac surgeon, currently the Director and Head of Cardiac Surgery at the Medical Super Specialty Hospital and is rated among the top few in South Asia. Currently, he is working to coalesce the South Asian nations together in the South Asian Forum of Cardio thoracic surgeons and being the past president of IACTS. Apart from his medical credentials, Dr. Sarkar is an ace debater, bestowed with excellent articulation skills and is the president of the Calcutta Debating Circle and chairs the largest live debate in India during the Calcutta's festival of the spoken word. Asia Reborn is a comprehensive, profound, scholarly narrative of the modern economic and political history of the continent of Asia as narrated by an Asian, Asian history from an Asian perspective. It describes the story of the meteoric rise of the continent of Asia during the 20th, latter phase of 20th century, which is one of the most compelling stories of a lifetime. Those of you who are from the city are no stranger to the fact that doctors are having a very bad time of late. <laughs> right? And uh, when, uh, just about a week back, my friend Kostov calls me and tells me that with all of six days and a few hours to spare, you've got to go through and discuss a book which is about 630 pages plus profuse notes. I thought that that was being very cruel. From that point of cruelty onwards, I think I owe to my friend Kostov a large debt of gratitude because without that push and provocation, at least an ignorant doctor with very few vestigial neurons still in circulation would not, would not have had the opportunity to get introduced to such a fantastic work of contemporary history. You see, generally people in contemporary times have become very famous by giving answers. But I have with me with somebody who became extremely famous by asking questions. Right. One question. So, one question. <laughs> and that question was so famous <laughs> that even the famous reporter to whom the current patriarch of India bows down in deference did a live interview with him, I think, n number of times. Yes. Right? So, uh, I mean, when Arnold Goswami asks you live questions these days, it is like getting the Oracle of Delphi to speak all over again. <laughs> and he survived it. And he survived it. <laughs> so having survived that acid test, we have, we are so glad to have Dr. Basu with us this evening. Right. And, you know, uh, Kostov has already uh, given us a kind of a central theme. I'm sure there are many central themes, but to us, uh, would you would you would you give your idea about Japan being being the crux of a kind of contrarian theory to the British colonization? I think a point you've made very well in the book. So to those of us who haven't been through the 630 pages yet, just give us a crux, a kernel of the concept. Yeah. So the concept is this: um, if you looked at Asia in 1900 there was absolutely no prospect of Asia being free. The Russo-Japanese war, of course, played a very important role in demonstrating that Asians could defeat Europeans. It was the first time that Europeans had been defeated by an Asian power since Kanhojiya Angre sank the British naval fleet in 1721. Who's, who's otherwise clouded as a pirate. He is called a pirate by the British, but of course he was the admiral of the Maratha fleet. 
and he sank uh, Commodore Foote's uh, fleet off the coast of what is now Bombay in 1721. That, uh, and before that, there were the Mongols. The Mongols, of course, defeated the uh, Europeans uh, in the 11th and 12th century. Uh, but since then, the Europeans had been on the ascendant, and there was no notion of Asia getting independent. In fact, if you look at uh, Yalta, Yalta, the agreement in February 1945. You can't hear me? Is it? Yeah, you can take that one. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, if you look at Yalta, in uh, uh, when the great powers were meeting at Yalta in 1945, February, they were divvying up Asia among themselves. In fact. They were trying to persuade Stalin to attack Japan because he hadn't declared war on Japan. In order to persuade him to uh, declare war on Japan, they offered him most of uh, what is today Dalian, uh, the most important port in northeastern China, and, and much of southern Manchuria as a reward. And Stalin actually declared war on Japan just a week before the war ended, two days after the uh, uh, after the uh, bomb fell, the atom bomb fell on Hiroshima. So that illustrates the way European powers operated. They believed that they would hold Asia forever. And in fact, uh, in May 1945, the British Chiefs of Staff wrote a white paper for the Prime Minister of Britain talking about what needs to be done to maintain an iron grip on India and the Indian Ocean until 1960s. So there was no notion of India getting independence. So it's important to understand what happened between May 1945 and February 1946. The key thing that happened was the INA trials. The INA trials created a national upsurge. And so Netaji Shuhash Chandra Bose gave us our independence. We have forgotten this. We have forgotten it in Bengal very much. But of course, in our history books, it is obscured. Because what happened was that immediately after, so, so that's one point. Now, to come back to Japan, a couple of things about Japan. First of all, in 1945, life expectancy at birth in India was 32 years. So after 190 years of British rule, life expectancy in India was 32 years. Average life, life expectancy in Africa was 38 years. Average life expectancy in China after 30 years of civil war was 41 years. And in the two the Japanese colonies of Korea and Taiwan, life expectancy was 55 years. A huge difference. 32 in India, 55 years. The typical Korean and Taiwanese could expect to live 55 years. Our literacy rate in India was 14% in 1945. The literacy rate in Korea and Taiwan was about 60%. So that was the vast difference that, uh, uh, that the Japanese had created. Now, in addition, in Korea, there was a steel industry, a substantial steel industry. There were six cement plants. Uh, there, was, uh, uh, there was a ship, significant shipbuilding sector. Uh, and there was a properly educated labor force, a properly educated engineering base that could help propel industrialization. So that is one aspect. The other aspect of the Japanese legacy is, during the war, Japan also controlled what is today Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam. Uh, and in all these places, they fostered nationalism. They incubated nationalism. The first thing that they did when they arrived in Indonesia was they released Sukarno from 10 consecutive years in jail. Sukarno and Hatta were released from jail and they were allowed to start developing a national identity for Indonesia by ensuring that all schools switched from teaching in the Dutch language to teaching in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, and that is what, bind, what helped bind Indonesia into a nation. In the Philippines, all uh, instruction in the schools occurred in American English until the Japanese arrived. 
When the Japanese arrived, they brought with them one of the generals, the only general of Aguinaldo's army from 1902-1903, who had not surrendered to the Americans. His name was Admiral Ricarte, and Ricarte uh, came with them, helped create a Philippine identity. They introduced Tagalog into the schools, and that is what helped bind the Philippines together. So, and the same thing really applies. So across Asia, now the other aspect that I bring about in the book is uh, from 1839 onwards, every war that the British fought in Asia was fought by the British Indian Army. So if you read Amitabh Ghosh's books, the, the Ibis Trilogy, you know that the first opium war was fought by Sipahis from Bihar and Bengal. And Similarly, uh, uh, at the same time, while, there were, while an entire Indian army was fighting the opium war in China, another Indian army called the Army of the Punjab, or uh, the Army of the Indus, was fighting to help take control of Afghanistan from the Afghans for the British. So now the British Indian Army, I think you know, one of the important lessons of what I, I, I've written is that the strategic culture, I mean, the fact that the only person who understood that the reason why Britain controlled India was a military reason was, of course, Nitali Shivash Chandra Bose and the entire legacy of revolutionaries who were based in Bengal, starting with Sri Aurobindo. Aurobindo Ghosh, of course, had an interest, very fascinating life. Uh, he was a brilliant man whose father was a Bangrage. And he was such a bang rage that he did not let his children, his elder children, uh, learn Bangla, Hindi, or any Indian language, only English. But he was head boy of the school, in, of the best school in England, St. Paul's School, London. He got a classic tripos from Cambridge. And then he became a nationalist. Such a nationalist that in his house, in the Ghosh, Ghosh Bari, uh, Bagan Bari in uh, Manitola, uh, there was a bomb factory discovered. And uh, of course, his brother Barin Ghosh was sentenced to death. It turned out that uh, Shami Ji's brother, Bhupendranath Dotto, was also uh, part of the Alipur bomb conspiracy. And that was the beginning. Now, why was the Alipur bomb conspiracy required? Can I, can I interrupt yeah. you for a minute? Yeah. Now, we will, we will. I think what will hold our rapt attention, we'll get into the Indian sector of things. Getting back to the Japanese sector yeah. of things, you know, somebody who is uh, sort of a confessed ignorant like myself, tend to believe that there is really nothing called a benevolent colonialism in the world. If we go through the various phases of, if we go through the various phases of sort of Japan's history, the Shogun phase, the Meiji phase, so on and so forth, the, perhaps the hunger in Japan to become colonial came from its lack of resources, the lack of land, and it spread itself. And you have ever so often right now the Japanese premiers visiting various countries and making uh, sort of tendering apologies for Japanese atrocities, the Nanjing disaster and the stuff like that. So, in other words, that what in you, I mean, in, in, in your analysis, were the critical elements of Japanese colonialism as opposed to that of the European or the British model that left behind a constructive legacy rather than a kind of, you know, a, a sort of antiquity of ruins mm. as the British did. So because I think this is very critical for us to know yeah. that where did they differ because they had their own compelling reasons to be colonial. They had it. Yes. But what did they do different? that you see the others were? Yes, very good question. So, what they did differently was a few things. First of all, when they first arrived in Taiwan, uh, they took control of Taiwan in 1895. Within the first two years, they had a comprehensive land reform in Taiwan. And as a result of that, Taiwan became the agricultural success story of Asia over the next 48 years. Uh, it, was a spe it was, in fact, the breadbasket of East Asia, uh, and not just producing bread, but also sugar and, and, and several other things. So 
That was one. Second is that they focused on education wherever they went. First of all, Japan was the first country after the United States to have universal literacy. Uh, and the other country that was close behind was Germany. Germany and Japan had universal literacy after the United States. The United States, you remember, even Abraham Lincoln, born you know, in the 1820s, uh, was educated despite being born in a log cabin. In Britain, universal literacy did not occur until the 19, late 1920s. So in India, uh, when Gandhiji first came back to India from South Africa, he said at his first uh, speech at the International Congress, why are we speaking in English? English is a language that is spoken by 400,000 people. 400,000 people in a country then of nearly 300 million. So the, in, in the British and the other European colonies, there was a thin veneer of, edu of an educated class and the rest were completely illiterate. So that was a dramatic difference. And the third thing is that Japan actually looked at Korea, Taiwan, Manchuria as an extension of itself. Uh, and they basically created a complete industrial structure there. Uh, that of course never existed in India. So if you think about India, we weren't allowed to be engineers. You know, in, in India, the only kind of engineering taught was civil engineering. Shippur Engineering College was that college. Uh, and uh, the only way we could have uh, mechanical and electrical engineering was after Madan Mohan Malviya started the BHU uh, in 1916 as part of the Swadeshi revolt. Now the Swadeshi revolt is very important. I think it's, and what uh, Postop referred to, I'll just quickly talk about uh, what he referred to because it has, very, it has great relevance here. Uh, just a uh, a few hundred meters from here is Rash Bihari Avenue. Rash Bihari Avenue is named after the wrong Rash Bihari. You know, there was a great revolutionary called Rash Bihari Bose. But Rash Bihari Ghosh was the president of Congress in the 1907 Surat Congress. And the Surat Congress ended Congress's commitment to Swaraj, Swadeshi, national education and boycott of British goods, which was the policy adopted in response to the partition of Bengal in 1905. And the partition of Bengal was a, was a direct consequence of Japan's victory in the Russo-Japanese War. This is the, the important thing to understand is that the British saw the Russo-Japanese War as being a very dangerous development because it was going to give the idea to Indians that they might also be able to be free and compete with the, with the Europeans. And so, the first thing that they did was to partition Bengal in, in, in consequence of that. And of course, the partition of Bengal, I, I just would like to say a few things about this because uh, the partition of Bengal basically, is, uh, before the partition, two thirds of the population of the undivided Bengal was Hindu, one third was Muslim. The real tragedy is that in 1911-12, when the partition of Bengal was rescinded, the British played their ultimate chess move. The first of their very successful gerrymanderings. The next one, of course, was in Ireland. But in Bengal, what they did was they managed to draw a border of Bengal, a newly reunited, reunited Bengal, in which 48.5% were Muslim, 48% were Hindu, and of course they also had created separate electorates that ensured that you would always have a Muslim government in Bengal from that point on. Now, why is this important? Because if you looked at Bengal then, it should have included cities like Dhanbad, Hazaribagh, uh, uh, Patna perhaps, uh, Rachi certainly, Rachi, Hazaribagh and Patna as well as uh, Dhanbad had clear Bengali majorities. Maithili, the language of Mithila, was written in the Bangla script until 1947. But they drew the border to ensure that Maithili would be part of Bihar, Mithila would be part of, part of Bihar. And as a result, they were able to create a Bengal 
where there would be a Muslim majority. And that is when Bengalis should have again risen in revolt, but they did not. And as a result, partition became inevitable then. Okay, so that's one. Now, the other aspect that I... Now, to come back to Rashbihari, Bose and Ghosh. Raj, Rashbihari Ghosh, he may have some descendants in this audience, but anyway, Rashbihari Ghosh uh, was a doctor. Uh, he was a fine doctor. But G.K. Gokhale, G.K. Gokhale did a coup against the nationalists. The nationalists were led by Aurobindo, then just Aurobindo Ghosh, and Lokmanya Tilak. Their, their program had been adopted by the entire Congress, including Dada Bhai Nauroji, the old man who was Congress president in 1906. He adopted the entire program of Swaraj, Swadeshi, boycott, and national education. National education is what resulted in the creation of Jadapur University, then called National College. Uh, anyway, so all of this was done uh, in 1906. But in 1907, there was a coup by Gokhale, and Rash Bihari Ghosh was the, lead, was the second man in that coup. Raj Bihari Bose was part of the Alipur bomb conspiracy. He then threw the bomb at Hardinge in 1912 when Hardinge, the new uh, governor general, uh, the new viceroy was coming into, into Delhi. Raj Bihari Bose threw a bomb at him, almost killed him, unfortunately just missed by a bit. There are a few episodes like this in Indian history where you miss the target. But anyway, he missed the target, but he was the man. And he then went to Japan. Raj Bihari Bose went to Japan. He escaped uh, and he was also the leader of the Gadar Rebellion in the, in the First World War. Gadar Rebellion is extremely important. It is completely obscure in our history books. But just think why the Rowlett Act was necessary in March 1919. On August the 20th, 1917, Britain promised effectively dominion status to India after the war, but after the First World War. But instead, they came up with the Rowlett Act because the Ghadar rebellion had been so successful that it had really put the fear of God into the British and they responded to the Rowlett Act. So these are all obscure in our history. During the First World War, by the way, Gandhiji was recruiting Indians for the British Indian Army. Uh, and so, so these, are, these are the stories that need to be told. Has a and, question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, regarding the Japanese colonialism, one of the uh, very disturbing features of European colonialism was uh, practice of racism. Indians and dogs not allowed, um, which was fueled by their plan of settler colonies. So they sent their population over to the colonies, yeah. who created their own enclaves and excluded the locals. Now my guess is, reading your book, the Japanese never practiced that sort of racism. Well, I, no, I don't think uh, I can absolve the Japanese of blame okay. for racism. Okay. Uh, and I make that point very clear in the book. I don't emphasize it, but uh, the Japanese had a very negative approach to some of the races they dealt with. In, in particular, uh, they were, uh, you know, the Nanjing massacre was an awful, awful event. Uh, there was a Sukhching massacre in Singapore. So there were, uh, in particular, with regard to the Chinese, they, they, they responded uh, in a very, uh, in a rather vicious way. But I think it's also important to recognize that during the Second World War, the single biggest atrocity was the famine, yes. which is called yes. the Bengal yes. famine. Yes. But it was a, it is actually an Indian famine. It occurred in Bengal primarily, but also in Bihar and Madras, uh, Madras presidency. It killed three and a half to six million people. The estimates differ. Three and a half to six million people as a deliberate act of policy by Winston Spencer Churchill. So in my book, Winston Churchill, after the great tyrants of the 20th century, the great tyrant, greatest tyrant of the 20th century was Mao Zedong. Just, just named as uh, the greatest Britain. Uh, Mao Zedong was, yeah, well, sad. Uh, but <laughs> Mao Zedong, Stalin, Hitler, and right after them is Winston Churchill. Uh, Three and a half to six million Indians killed deliberately through policy, the Bengal, fa the Bengal Indian famine. <coughs> and not just that, in, uh, after the First World War, he was colonial secretary, he, he chemical bombed the Iraqis of Basra and Karbala, killed 20,000 people using the Royal Indian Air Force. Uh, so the crimes that he committed are legion, and those cannot be forgotten. Um,
So, but I don't absolve the Japanese of blame. But it, the, the, the difference was really that the Japanese behaved very positively towards the Indonesians, the Vietnamese, the Indians in Southeast Asia. They were, now, I mean, we owe a lot to Japan uh, because Japan aligned with the Indian National Army. It's important to understand that the Indian National Army, the Azad Hill Forge, was not a quizzling army. It was not. Uh, it was not under Japanese control at all. It was a completely separate army, fully financed by uh, by uh, donations by Indians in Southeast Asia. Uh, and this is something. This is a realization I came to after I moved to Southeast Asia, because I met hundreds of people who fought for our freedom. They were civilians. I met three or four women, and uh, one was the deputy commander of the Rani Jhansi Regiment, Jana Kithebar. I asked her, so how often had you been to India? You, you go every year, every two years? She said, no, I was 16 years old. I'd never been to India. The first time I touched the soil of, in, of India was in Manipur in 1944 with a gun in my hand. Do we as a nation not owe these people who fought for our freedom at least a debt of gratitude? Unfortunately, they have been erased from our history books. Anyway, so that's now. Japan was the ally that enabled that to happen. We were fighting alongside the Japanese. And uh, so we're beginning now. We finally, we're beginning to commemorate this aspect. Uh, can I just take a step back and ask you, I mean, two questions, just take it away, I think, in the same trend. Keep it close to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think this is a little bit more awake. One is that in the context of 1904 and 5, the Russo-Japanese War, I mean, we Bengalis are not entirely unfamiliar with the uh, with leadership, vacuum and bad leadership. It's almost inbuilt in us in contemporary times. But what really, what really stopped us mm. from seizing the initiative in the early 1900s? Mm. Because if memory serves me right, something somebody like Warren Hastings has made the remark that about 300 million people were administered by a group of 5,000 Britishers. That if every Indian had picked up a fistful of sand and thrown it at the British Army, that would be the war of independence started and finished. Yes. But it never happened. So first question is, even in the context when Japan, etc., was on the march, what prevented us from doing so? And the second question is, so that you know we don't we don't uh, interrupt your flow, is that in the context of a the INA and b being in Bengal. We, we take a lot of, you know, a sort of emotive pride in the sort of armed movement of Bengal, the part, the version of the freedom struggle that we have been familiar with. But that was a trait, that was a chapter of history that is very difficult to connect to the common na narrative today of Indian independence. It makes us, it makes us a little bit, uh, uh, you know, think that why did the leadership of 1905 was indifferent to this opportunity? It did not come back to us till four decades later. Yeah. And point number two is that the kind of trait that the independence movement in Bengal had taken, they were almost like two parallel lines. The nearer we got to 47, more was the divergence. And a, and, 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 a, and a boy or a girl of today would tend to think that one was totally disconnected with the other. Yeah. How do you explain or give us an insight into the syndrome? That's a terrific question again. Uh, so, basically, it boils down to that great event, the Surat Congress of 1907. In the Surat Congress, there was a coup by G.K. Gokhale on behalf of the British. The Congress gave up Swaraj as its goal. It gave up even dominion status as its goal. It, its goal became, from 1907 onwards, the goal of the Congress was to become a loyal member of the British Empire. 
loyal member of the British Empire. You can look it up. So, that's a strong statement. Now, uh, if you remember your history, Mohandas Gandhi and Muhammad Ali Jinnah were the two leading disciples of G.K. Gokhale. So G.K. Gokhale was the leader of the pro-British segment of the Indian national movement. If you look at the history of who went to jail, no Muslim League person, no person who was only a member of the Muslim League was ever sent to jail by the British. When Gandhi and Nehru and Patel and all the Congress leaders were sent to jail, they were sent to very pleasant jails, Aga Khan's palace <laughs> and so on. Uh, Yarabdar jail is also actually quite a pleasant place. The ones who were true enemies of the British were sent to Kalapani. The 14 conspiracy, the, the Port Blair, in the central jail in Port Blair, from where escape is impossible and where you were sent for rigorous imprisonment. So the 14 members of the Alipur bomb conspiracy, including Shamiji's brother, Barin Ghosh, Sriorvindo's brother, etc., were sent to Kalapani. Many of those, actually, after they were released after the First World War, gave up the national struggle and joined Sri Aurobindo in his ashram in Pondicherry. But uh, the other next set of enemies were sent to Burma, Myanmar, what is now Myanmar, Mandalay. Who was sent to Mandalay? Lokmanya Tilak and Netaji Shwasan Bos. Uh, Veer Savarkar was sent to Kalapani. So today when we think about what happened, the story is that the strand of India's independence movement that was pro-British were the people to whom eventually Britain handed power at the end. And, but they were forced to hand power because there was an armed movement that demonstrated that <coughs> Indians could well, form sir. their own army. It formed their own army, and as a result of that army being formed, uh, the INA trials resulted in the acquittal of the three senior most officers. Shanawas, Dhillan, and Saigal were acquitted on the 3rd of January 1946. And then, the reason for the acquittal was, Auchinleck wrote a letter to all the senior officers of the British Indian Army saying, I had to acquit them, because had I not, there would be a rebellion in the, in, the, in the armed forces and we would not be able to hold India any longer. But even though he had acquitted them, there was a rebellion starting in the Royal Indian Air Force on the 15th of January 1946. 5,200 personnel of the Royal Indian Air Force mutiny. And then the mutiny spread to the HMIS Talwar on the 8th of February 1946. And by the 18th, it had spread to all the ports of the Royal Indian Navy. Every single port had joined the mutiny. Uh, there was a huge demonstration in Kolkata and another massive one in Karachi and, and in Bombay. In Bombay, 228 people were killed, civilians were killed during the demonstrations. And they were all carrying Nitaji Shubhash Chandra Bose's portrait and marching through the streets of Bombay, Karachi and Kolkata. On the 19th of February, the day after the, the, I, uh, the Royal Indian Mutiny had spread to every single port and 78 of the 88 ships, the Royal Indian Navy had 88 ships, 78 of them joined the mutiny. That was the end of the British Empire. It was then fought. So Wavell asked actually to send him three British battalions. Do we know how, how <laughs> it went? Well? And, and I'll tell you. So he sent for three British battalions and Attlee said, nonsense, we cannot send you a single battalion. Forget about it. He said, then how do we hold India? It's not possible. So on the 19th of February, Attlee announced in the House of Commons for the very first time, remember in May 1945, he had said, six, yeah, at least 15 years, this is how we hold India. He suddenly announced on the 19th of February 1946 that I am sending three of my senior most cabinet members, the Defense Secretary, the Secretary for India, and one other, Cripps, senior member of the Labour Party, was sent to India 
to negotiate India's freedom. That was the first time ever that Britain said they would be negotiating India's freedom. Our Independence Day, if there is one, the right Independence Day was 19th February 1946. That was the day that the British threw in the towel. But then they spent the next 18 months ensuring that India would be divided. That was what they did. Now, Patel was sent, you know, Patel actually went into uh, the ships in Bombay and appealed to the soldiers and the, the, uh, the sailors to end the rebellion. Gandhiji appealed to them, uh, Jinnah appealed to them. So there was a joint appeal by all the leaders saying, please bring down the rebellion because we are now getting freedom. And that is how it ended. Now, in our history books, the Royal Indian Navy mutinies barely mention it. It warrants about one pay, one line it's not in the I, it's not I, ISC history book. It's not. ICSC history book, one line. Yeah. Huh? yeah, West Bengal Board, I don't, I'm not quite sure. I don't think it's there. Is it barely, not even mentioned. Not even mentioned. Not even mentioned. So, this is the perversion that needs to end. Now, the reason I became interested, I mean, in, in, in class 10, I read Bhakti Devota by and it's not very clear what that rebellion is about. It's a rebellion. Tarashankar is about a rebellion. And it's clear to me now that that was the Gadar rebellion during the First World War. So, Bengal led India in thinking. Uh, so, we had Shamiji, we had Sri Aurobindo, we had Jagadish Chandra Bose. Profundo on the right. If you just think in any field of endeavor, they were among the world's leaders. They were not just leaders of a province of Bengal. They were they were brilliant people who were forming the ideas that drove the world, especially Asia and Rabindranath, uh, and of course Bonkim Chandra. And the 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 quality of personnel in Bengal in the period from about 1850 to 1920 was just absolutely remarkable. Can I, but can that I? stream was, sure. was, was, um, intentionally it was intentionally marginalized and replaced by the pro-British element. The kind of early 1900s, the almost indifference of Vivekananda to what was happening in the political atmosphere, and later on, the kind of I don't think Rabindranath resonated with much that was happening in mainstream political life of Bengal. So do you think two of the most towering Bengali personalities of that era, did they have a kind of additive effect or did they kind of have a subtractive effect from this enterprise towards true independence? Well, I, I haven't uh, explored the entire story of Shamiji's, Shami Vivekananda's uh, uh, commitment to nationalism. But Shamiji gave the responsibility for creating an Indian nationality, ironically, to uh, Sister Nivedita. And Sister Nivedita was the key person. From 1903 to 1911, the day she died, I mean, the day she died in Darjeeling in 1911. For those eight years, she played the key role in advising Gokhale, not just advising him, admonishing him for taking the stance he took in 1907, advising in particular Sri Aurobindo. Sri Aurobindo, of course, was a, was a, was a Shamiji Bhakta, and he was continuing, he thought, very much the legacy of Shami Vivekananda in creating a national identity for India. Now, there is a, there's a canard about uh, the nationalist movement of, of Bengal in 1905 being only, only a Hindu nationalist one. It was primarily led by people who were inspired by Bhumkim and so on. But Bhumkim, first of all, Anandamot has nothing that is anti-Muslim. There is not a single shred that is anti-Muslim in Anandamot. I don't know how they have created this myth that Anandamot was an, is an anti-Muslim document. It's not. Uh, but it was the Shunnashi rebellion that he's talking about, which was a response to the first famine that occurred uh, in 1770 after Bengal fell to the British in 1757. Anyway, so now uh, the uh, 
Rovindranath. Rovindranath ceased to be a nationalist. But in 19, between 1905 and 1907, he was a nationalist. And uh, he wrote Amar Shunar Bangla in 1905. So it is today the national anthem of Bangladesh. Uh, and if you think about uh, what, I mean, basically after 1915, 1916, Rabindranath moved away from politics entirely. He became a post-nationalist. He was not, he, he felt that nationalism was a negative force. And he ceased to be a, a nationalist. But he had his own sphere. His sphere of influence was culture. Uh, and he played an enormous role in that area. He, he moved away from politics uh, because he was disillusioned by some of the things that happened in 1907-8 and so on. Uh, we will just spare a few minutes for a couple of questions at the end. Uh, in, in, in probably uh, whatever time is left to us, I think we would be very, very interested in asking you at what juncture at which particular point of time in this narrative, in your, in your eyes, is the partition of India becoming an inevitable reality? What brings this monstrosity down on us? Well, uh, the British decided uh, that if they were to ever leave any country, they would leave it divided. This was a decision that was made more or less by Elphinstone. They always did. Uh, in, in at least 1859. You know, the first, the first evidence is 1859, Elphinstone talking about divide empire as being the policy of the British. And so, in 1905, after the partition of Bengal, the next thing that they did was to try and create the Muslim League. They, the Muslim League was created by the Governor General, uh, the Viceroy. Um, and the voice, Viceroy called all the leaders of the Muslim mov movement to uh, Viceroy's house. Then, of course, in Kolkata, Borla, what is now I think the National Library, uh, he, called him to, he called them the only person among the invitees who refused to come was Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Muhammad Ali Jinnah said, no, this is a separatist attempt. I am an Indian nationalist. I will not go. Interestingly, Jinnah did not go. Uh, Maulana Azad was not invited because Maulana Azad was an acolyte of Sri Aurobindo. Uh, he was introduced into Indian nationalism by Sri Aurobindo. So that my point about the movement not being Hindu nationalist is, is evidenced by the fact that Maulana Azad, who was a true Muslim, he understood Islam far more than Muhammad Ali Jinnah did. He was a Maulana after all. He's a proper Maulana. Uh, and his uh, his uh, Hakutala was in fact uh, a Maulana in the Mughal court in Delhi uh, in 1857. So, uh, so that that's now the the point of, of this exercise is that they were uh, there was a proper nationalist movement, and uh, and it was it, it embraced not just Hindus but uh, prominent Muslims. But the British created the idea of a Muslim League. And the Muslim, and they basically told the Muslim League that your goal should be only one thing and one thing alone, and that is to create separate electorates. And the British decided that there would be separate electorates, and you see the story just playing itself out right through the period of separate electorates. But ultimately, uh, when you look at what happened in 1946-47, even Maulana Azad blamed partition far more on Jawaharlal Nehru than on anybody else. And there are two or three reasons for this. First of all, he, uh, in 1937, when the Congress won the state of United Provinces, what is now called UP, Uttar Pradesh, United Provinces was won by Congress in alliance with Muslim League. Uh, but Congress had a majority. They had the ability to form a government on their own. They refused to align with the Muslim League in forming a government. So that, that is what alienated Jinnah to begin with. And also at that time, there was a terrible mistake made by uh, uh, Nehru. The leader of the Bombay Presidency in Congress was a man called Nariman. His name adorns Nariman Point today. Nariman should have become the chief minister of that province, but they appointed B.G. Khair instead. Nariman was a Parsi, so the Congress wasn't even capable of appointing a Parsi as a, as a chief minister. 
And in Bihar, there was a Muslim who should have been the, uh, uh, the chief minister. Instead, they appointed Sri Krishna Sunna. So, errors made by Nehru and Patel there. And then, an awful error when Netaji, of course, Netaji was kept out. He was kept in jail until the 1937 election was over. Most of the time. And so he was allowed to be, he was released from jail in 1937. When he was released, he was such a national figure that Congress had to, had to let him become president. So he became president in 1938. And of course, in 1930, he had convinced Congress to adopt independence as its goal, not dominion status. Netaji did that, by the way, nobody else. In 1938, when he became Congress president, Bengal had a Muslim League government because it was of separate electorates. The Muslim League had the government in Bengal. <laughs> Netaji also replaced a Muslim League government in Assam and a Muslim League government in Sindh with a Congress-led government in those two provinces. And then he came to Bengal. He said, now Bengal, he spoke to Fazlul Haq and he worked out a deal. Fazlul Haq had the second biggest party after Congress in the Legislative Assembly of Bengal. Third biggest party was Muslim League, but Muslim League had formed the government of the Europeans. Netaji worked out a deal with Fazlul Haq to form a Congress-led government in Bengal in late 1938. G.D. Birla went to Mahatma Gandhi and said, it is a very bad idea to dismiss the Muslim League government. Muslim League government is much more pro-business government or led by the Bose brothers and Fazlul Haq will be anti-business. So we should not have this government. Gandhi supported uh, G.D. Birla over the elected president of Congress. As a result, Fazlul Haq said, Gandhi is my enemy from this day forward. And that is why Fazlul Haq supported the creation of Pakistan. He came to regret that so much that in 1953, soon after Fazlul Haq became the chief minister, elected chief minister of East Pakistan after the first election was won, or was held in that, in that province after the partition, Fazlul Haq, within a few weeks of becoming chief minister of East Pakistan, came to Kolkata and spoke at the, uh, at the Sharad Bosch Academy. And he said, India is my motherland. And it is the greatest regret of my life that I participated in the partition of this motherland. From this day forward, I will commit the rest of my life to the reunification of my motherland and the creation of a federation of Hindustan and Pakistan. As soon as he went back to Pakistan, he was dismissed. This was an act of high treason. Now, not just that, but in 1957, when the, soon after Pakistan became a republic, Pakistan was supposed to have their first national election in early 1959. It became clear by the middle of 1958 that the election in Pakistan would be won in every province by a party that was pro-India that was anti-partition. So the election never happened. Instead, Ayub Khan had a coup that was helped by the Americans, that was uh, allowed to happen by the Americans, and almost certainly uh, occurred as a result of, uh, of American support. And the rest is history. Now, so partition need not have happened. Also, if the cabinet mission plan had been accepted by Congress, in 1946. In July 1946, the Congress accepted the cabinet mission plan until Congress President Jawaharlal Nehru gave a press conference at which he said, after, once we have independence, we don't need to stick to the cabinet mission plan. And that is what ended. Uh, just before that, both Congress and Muslim League had accepted the cabinet mission plan, which would create a loose federation uh, that would be a united India. The Americans were totally in favor of a united India uh, in 1946 and 47. But it was Jawaharlal Nehru whose idiocy led ultimately to much. Strong words, strong words. But those were the days and bitter it is 
I think much of it probably has to be accepted. We are nearly at the stroke of an hour and we'll have the last five or seven minutes for those of you who are yearning to ask some questions. Uh, and there's one question regarding the partition in 1946. Twelve of the 15 provinces in India, the Congress Committee had selected Sardar Patel as their leader instead of Jahadal. But Gandhi didn't. So Nehru had the minority support. Gandhi wanted the that's, that's one question. So that's yeah. it. Yeah. So my question is yeah. that Sardar Patel had made the Congress and become the Prime Minister of India at that point of time, do you think partition would have been avoided? We'll what kind of India would you have In your book, have you ever have you mentioned anywhere about the sourcing of the INA during the war years? Yeah. And the trail there has subsequently followed. I want to just ask one question that India, Asia of the future, because if we have talked about the past, Surely, he has some vision about the future of India in Asia and in the world. What does he see that India should do to become a power to recommend? Yes, I, 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 I think that's enough. That's enough. Oh, okay. First of all, Sadar Patel was in fact nominated by 12 of the 15 Pradesh Congress committees. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru was nominated by zero, none. Uh, two nominated. Uh, Triplani and one nominated uh, Mulan Azad. But uh, if, I think to answer your question, I think Sardar Patel would have handled the situation far better and he would have ensured that the cabinet vision plan would be slightly altered but uh, acceptable to both sides and partition would then have become unnecessary. Uh, though yeah. It's also important to recognize that Sadar Patel also used to go to quite comfortable jails. He was also part of the same uh, British Trade club, so, so pro-British so-called so moderate club. Okay. Now, uh, now, as far as I mean, there were a few questions yeah, about I, INA sourcing, the sourcing INA of INA. Sourcing. Okay, INA. The INA at its height had about sixty thousand uh, soldiers, men and women, and the. The INA basically received contributions from about two and a half million Indians who live in Southeast Asia. Out of the 60,000, about 40,000, about 37,000 or so were Indian prisoners of war. The other 23,000 were civilian recruits from, uh, from Southeast Asia. And I have found that almost every single family in Singapore, Malaya, there were very few Indians in, Indian, in what is now Indonesia, in Thailand, everybody joined either the INA or the civilian equivalent was the Indian Independence League. So the entire Southeast Asian Indian population joined. Most of the wealthy businessmen of the region donated enormous amounts to create the Azad Hind Bank which had its own currency that was fully backed by gold uh, and uh, it, issued, it issued stamps, etc. And it was basically recognized by nine uh, national governments at that time. When Bhulabhai Desai argued for the INA in the trial in November 1946, he said this was a duly constituted government of an enslaved people and therefore they had every right to fight for independence. Uh, they were not fighting, uh, they, they were not rebelling because they had, even the prisoners of war had been handed over to the Japanese side. What was the uh, size of the corpus like? Do you have an idea? The total, uh, not here, so we don't know, we don't know, we don't know the exact amount. It was a fairly large amount, but it was fully backed by gold. There was, the currency was not a, a currency that was plunging in value. It was actually acceptable currency. And um, so, unlike the, the uh, Japanese issued dollars, which were actually plunging in value during that time uh, in that region, the Indian the, the, the rupee uh, that was issued by the Azad Hind government was backed by gold and therefore acceptable as currency. Uh, I think the, the, the most important aspect, the lessons, if I have to draw some lessons from the book, first lesson is that 
Nehru and the initial government of India, especially Krishna Menon, did not understand the strategic importance of the British Indian Armed Forces. So they allowed the British Indian Armed Forces to wither away. And also, of course, they did not understand the enormous strategic threat that communist China represented. So the biggest error, of course, began in October 1950, when, uh, when China invaded Tibet. Tibet is always our neighbor. To look through history, uh, Buddhism was taken to Tibet by a Bengali in the 12th century. Uh, from the Pal dynasty. The Pal dynasty, of course, was a Buddhist dynasty, and uh, history demonstrates that Buddhism arrived in Tibet from Bengal. So we have a long standing relationship between Tibet and Bengal uh, that also, of course, existed in the great University of Nalanda, which was in what is today Bihar, but was part of the Bengal, uh, Bengal presidency until 1905. Now, so the greatest challenge to India's integrity, to India's future as a nation, is China. And I think we have to understand that China is an imperial power. It is an imperial power with, uh, with ambitions to control the whole of Asia. Uh, throughout history, China has looked at India as being the only country that they have some respect for in Asia. The rest of Asia should be vassal states of China. That is their vision. In fact, when Donald Trump met Xi Jinping, the one tweet that came out of Trump after that meeting was, did you know that Korea used to be part of China? <laughs> so Xi Jinping had convinced Donald Trump that Korea used to be part of China. The Koreans are livid. Both the South Koreans and the North Koreans are livid. But Xi Jinping has convinced and quite frankly, but Tibet, now I have demonstrated <laughs> in the book that Tibet was never part of China as long as China was ruled by Chinese. We don't realize this, but for most of the last 1700 years before 1912, apart from uh, 263 of those 1700 years, China was also ruled by foreigners. The last giant dynasty of China was a Manchu dynasty. They spoke a Turkic language. And they, to remind the Chinese that they were slaves of the, of the Manchus, they had to shave the front of their head, and the women had to bind their feet. This was the Manchus telling the Chinese that you are our slaves. Now, the Manchus had a relationship with Tibet because the Manchus were Buddhists. Before that, you had the Mongol dynasty. Now, between the Mongol dynasty, which is called the Yuan dynasty, and the Manchu dynasty, there was a Chinese dynasty called the Ming dynasty. The Ming dynasty had no links to Tibet, no links at all, leave alone having a governor and an ambassador, then no links. In 1950, before the invasion of Tibet, the only way that Chinese ambassadors could reach Lhasa was through Kolkata and Kalimpong. They used to come to Kolkata, go to Kalimpong and then enter by foot into the southern part of Tibet. So we had the relationship with Tibet. And we've allowed this to wither away. Now, some things in history cannot be changed, but I think it's vitally important that we have a robust economy that grows much faster. Uh, the way to do that is to copy many of the things that Japan did. The most important thing to my mind is that you have to ensure that real estate or property speculation is not an important way to make money. In, uh, in, your, in your economy. If you allow property speculation to become uh, an important source of money making, then you're not going to have enough entrepreneurial capital to devote to the industries that can help you to grow. Okay, that's one. Except now, now, you see, in, in, uh, in India, when there's a particular party in power, the property prices so, and when the other party is in power, property prices collapse. I mean, this is a very interesting point. I don't think they even realize, I don't think the BJP realizes that they are on to the right track or with, with regard to this. Now, the second thing that is required is we need to transform our labor market 
if Bangladesh can be the second largest garment exporter in the world, why can't West Bengal do the same thing? Uh, we in West Bengal have the most antiquated labor market in, 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 uh, in this part of the world. This needs to change. But all of India has a problem. You know, we had you know, the BJP in its uh, 2014 uh, manifesto talked about labor market reform. But what they implemented was extremely modest, marginal changes to the labor market and in five or six states. One of those states, by the way, is Rajasthan, where they just lost the election. So, uh, labor market reform, much more comprehensive labor market reform to enable India to become a producer of labor intensive manufactured products. Now, unfortunately, even Arvind Subramaniam says that we now need to move into the fourth industrial revolution and forget the first, second, and third. But if you look at the history of every country in Asia, not just Asia, but actually look at world history, all countries that industrialized began with textiles, garments, shoes, and toys to absorb the excess labor in agriculture. And we have missed that boat entirely so far. I don't think we have entirely missed the boat. We still can, uh, can uh, undertake labor market reforms. Hopefully, post the next election, there will be significant labor market reform. It is absolutely essential because the demographic dividend comes only once. We are still in the midst of a demographic dividend that has lasted about 25 years. It has another 15 years to run. Now, if we don't take advantage of this opportunity to transform opportunities for the poor in India in a dramatic way, basically give them industrial jobs and enable them to be educated. Of course, education is the other thing that we have missed out on. I mean, education, we were very slow to move to mass literacy. All of East Asia moved to mass literacy, um, copying the Japanese by about 1990. We still don't have universal literacy in India today. It is an absolute disgrace. Uh, and this was an absolutely disgraceful policy that was actually adopted. I mean, I've heard senior civil servants in 1990 tell me, but what will they do if they all get educated? Then who's going to do our job? Who's going to do the dirty jobs? You know, you don't need to think like that. Once they are edu once the mass of people is educated, they will automatically be able to do many more things. Uh, and um, you know, unfortunately, we haven't. You know, we're slowly. I think over the last ten or fifteen years, we have come to universal. We are, we are at least moving towards universal. But it's very slow. So I think those are the, those are some of the key things that need to happen, uh, and the opportunity is still there, because if we don't do it, then India as we know it will cease to exist. And through much of our history, if you think about the history of India, uh, there have been periods of unity that are relatively brief, and large periods of disunity that frequently occur. So we need to think about what can make us, what can bind us together as a nation. Think of the lessons that Shamiji gave us. Think of the lessons that our original founders gave us and they had brilliant ideas. And I think we can then create a united nation, a united India that is a force to reckon with. Uh, we are far from that at the moment. I mean, if you think about East Asia, the, the prosperity of everybody east of us is still shockingly way ahead of us. And we are about to see Bangladesh catching up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Basu. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we live in times when recently we have seen that a person qualified in history has just become the governor of the Central Bank of India. Right. And over the almost a good part of last hour and a half, you have seen a hardcore economist give an exposition of history, the likes of which are not really seen or witnessed, both in its depth, its spectrum, and its content. So I think all of us needs to give Dr. Basu a great hand, because we still have not asked him a crucial question which will remain a secret, 
is the amount of midnight oil he burnt, he spent behind the book, the amount of exhaustive research that has gone behind it, because a 680 pages encyclopedic treatise doesn't come out of nothing. I think the whole book, if not parts of it, needs translating into Bangla.